of um, Anthony Crowell, our Dean and President, who unfortunately could not be with us tonight. Uh, my name is Jeff Becker, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Career Planning here at New York Law School. Um, I welcome you all, students, alumni, um, and honored guests from uh, the legal community uh, at large in the tri-state areas for uh, what we are sure um, and certainly hope will be a lively discussion on from law school to practice. Uh, it, it, it doesn't take um, a rocket scientist uh, or, or a lawyer uh, to realize that there are many um, fast changes in the legal market uh, and in ac legal academia. Uh, and keeping abreast of those, figuring out how to prepare our students and our junior um, and senior lawyers um, to continue uh, even in the most traditional practices in this day and age um, is a challenge, um, one that uh, most in this room are, are up for um, and one that is exciting but a challenge nonetheless. So I certainly am uh, excited to hear what our panelists of esteemed lawyers here in, in the city have to say um, and I'm very thankful um, for Bloomberg News for sponsoring this. And uh, without further ado, I introduce our moderator, Lee Pacquia, who is a 2006 grad of New York Law School and the host of The Business of Law. Lee. Hello. Um, welcome to our little talk this evening. I'm Lee Pacquia. Uh, I'm a producer and host of a couple web TV programs at Bloomberg Law. One of them is uh, The Business of Law. Um, and over the course of programming, we spend, um, as you might imagine, quite a lot of time discussing the economic challenges facing law firms and, and law schools alike. It's really a, an interesting time to be studying this, this area of the, uh, of the economy. And uh, just before we, we kick off, I want to give a little bit of context here um, without <coughs> getting too granular on um, these issues, uh, we really are living in an unprecedented times. Since the start of the legal recession in 2008, um, it has become very difficult for large law firms to find growth. Um, we're continuing to see demand for major parts of the business uh, slow down. Uh, there are questions as to whether some practice areas are going to come back. And um, we're seeing a lot of new entrants compete for and take away work that has traditionally been done by law firms. Um, suffice to say, it's a tremendously challenging time to be running a law firm. And these factors obviously put a lot of pressure on the employment side of, of the picture. Um, a huge glut of law students are coming onto the market each year looking for fewer and fewer high paying law jobs. Um, navigating today's legal employment landscape is, is simply a, a difficult feat. So with that in mind, tonight uh, I'd like to frame a discussion around some of the things one can do or at least think about doing while in law school. Um, after all, your time in law school is finite. Um, it's actually quite short. Um, I guess that would be a, uh, a bit of a relief for, for some people that I know who are going through the process right now. Um, but there are things that you need to be thinking about um, in terms of where you want your career to go. Um, and it's my hope that tonight's panel can help uh, aid in that process. So that said, I'm happy to say we have a really accomplished panel. Um, starting off all the way on my right, we have Aurora Kassirer. She's a partner and executive committee member at Troutman Sanders. And from 2005 to 2012, she was managing partner of the New York and New Jersey office. Uh, next to her is Bill Rochelle, uh, my partner in crime on the, uh, the Bloomberg Law bankruptcy web show called Bill on Bankruptcy. You can go check it out on YouTube. Uh, prior to his time at uh, Bloomberg, Bill spent many years um, working as a bankruptcy attorney for large law firms such as Phil Fulbright and Jaworski and Wild Gottschall and Manges. Um, next to Bill, we have uh, Peter Sacraponti. He's the co-chair at McDermott, Will & Emery, LLP. He's also a trustee at Fordham University. And finally, we have Jay Grushkin, partner at Millbank Tweed based here in New York. Jay is one of the longest serving hiring partners for a big law outfit. So um, obviously we have a ton of professional and life experience up on the stage today. And uh, in the interest of keeping this talk digestible, I'm going to uh, start off by asking each panel member uh, to give some, some opening remarks. But in that window, uh, if they could address three, what I view as really crucial questions, um, that would be fantastic. And then we're gonna have some follow-ups and uh, 
uh, knowing how bright this panel is, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some riveting uh, cross-panel questions pop out uh, in the process. And then after that, we'll have some time for Q&A uh, if anyone is um, so inclined. So the three things that I'd like um, each of our panelists to address today uh, break down to uh, fundamental questions. I'd like to know how they got their start in what they view as their primary practice area of their career. How did you become a bankruptcy attorney? How did you become a structured finance attorney? How did that process happen? And then the second question I'd like addressed is, how is that practice area doing today as a business? Is it going well? Is it faring poorly? Is the picture muddled? I want to talk about the practice area as a business, because that, at the end of the day, this is what practicing law is. It's a business. Then finally, I want to know where things, in their view, are going to be in that practice area in two years. I, I want to get to whether it makes sense for the people in the crowd today watching this audience live or, or on video later can I go into the field with a reasonable expectation of having a career in that practice area. So with that in mind, Bill, let's start off with you because you have some really interesting perspective on uh, what has happened um, in the bankruptcy law space. You came up at a time um, not too far away from when the uh, the new code came online, yeah, I, and I, I, bankruptcy I got, went from a, a humble practice area <clears throat> to, uh, over the years, a yeah, practice center for large started, law firms. I got started about the time of the eradication of a debtor's prison. Right. Uh, <laughs> indeed, I came out of bankruptcy, or excuse me, out of law school uh, shortly after the invention of the telephone. Uh, <laughs> at the time, believe it or not, uh, and this was in the 1970s, there was a recession going on. And law jobs were very difficult to find, even for people coming out of the finest law schools. I was, however, fortunate in getting a job, as I wanted, in a litigation department at a significant firm. I discovered after a year or so that uh, I wanted actually to be a trial lawyer, but that at a large firm in New York, that was simply not going to happen, and I wanted to use abilities in public speaking and thinking on my feet, I knew from family experience that bankruptcy lawyers are in court all the time. Uh, ergo, what I was looking for was a law business that would best utilize my skills. I also mm -hmm. like to write. Now, how easy a go was it breaking into bankruptcy law? It was not difficult because by this point, I was a year, a year and a half out of law school. I actually knew where to find the library by that point. I actually had some experience in researching and writing. So for me, getting a job at a law firm in bankruptcy was not difficult also because at the time, the bankruptcy practice was viewed as scum. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's the way it was. It wasn't until, I'd say, the 1980s or even 1990s that bankruptcy took on an acceptable cachet. So it was not terribly difficult for me to get a job at a good bankruptcy law firm, which happened to be Wild Gotchel and Mangies back during its uh, earliest growth years. Uh, that for me was an excellent uh, internship, and I think everybody in law needs an internship. An internship at age 28 after you have been out of law school for how many years? Uh, yeah, that's about right. Uh, but. Whenever you get out of law school, I think if you want to be a lawyer for the rest of your life, and I hope to God you don't, uh, as I haven't been a lawyer for the rest of my life because I jumped ship a few years ago to do something I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is very important to have an internship, just like doctors. Work your tail off for somewhere between five and eight years because you've got to learn the profession. And if you think you can learn the profession in 32 hours a week uh, without pressure, you are mistaken. There are perhaps some people with great capacity or great fortune who can, can become fine lawyers without an internship, but I think they are few and far between. And Weil was my internship. Mm. And I went on from there profiting from what I learned. And I stayed in the business until 2007 when, almost out of the blue, I got an offer to come and write for Bloomberg News, which is frankly something I'd wanted to do for a good 10 or 15 years. Uh, and as I said a minute ago, uh, keep your eye open 
once you do become a lawyer, about jumping ship and doing something else using some of the skills that you have gained. Now, Bill, at Bloomberg, you cover bankruptcy law. Um, as a business, how are bankruptcy practitioners faring today? Well, right now, I would like to find an area of law that is in <coughs> less of a depression than bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a really severely depressed area right now because bankruptcy practices have changed completely with the advent of prepacks and uh, prearranged sales and things of this sort. Companies come in and out of bankruptcy in as few as five weeks and that throws off very little work. Indeed, the best thing I could say about the future of bankruptcy law is that right now, it is, everyone has extreme pessimism, and I mean everyone, about the future of the bankruptcy practice. But just like in the stock market, if everyone is extremely pessimistic, that is a bullish sign. Uh, because any improvement will uh, drop to the bottom line. Right. I think we're at the point in bankruptcy practice where it, it can't get worse. I mean, is that a valid statement I in terms believe, of busyness? I think, I think that's, I think that's uh, uh, correct. Uh, it's going to get a little bit worse, perhaps, but uh, I can't imagine that it's uh, going to get terribly much worse. And by the way, something my father told me, he was a bankruptcy lawyer in Texas a long time ago. He always told me that business was best in and following a boom, not during bad times. In fact, I remember, Lee, when I was a young, wet-behind-the-ears lawyer, uh, I remember talking with an old bankruptcy fox in the bankruptcy court one day. And this was a man who was a young lawyer at the time of the Great Depression. And he told me that in the first few years of the Depression, bankruptcy business was great. Hmm. But then later in the Depression, nobody had money and bankruptcy lawyers couldn't even make a living. Hmm. Jay, how about you? How did you get your start in your primary practice area? Um, that's uh, it's an interesting question because I'm still trying to uh, determine what my primary practice area is. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've been with my firm. Uh, I basically went from my lemonade stand to, to Millbank, and I, I've just started my uh, 32nd year at, at Millbank, and it's been it's been quite an adventure. My career, I'd like to tell you, is the result of a lot of strategy and, and cognition and, and foresight. But the reality is that a lot of it is a little bit like the, uh, the feather in Forrest Gump. So <laughs> I came out of law school. Um, I had clerked in New York for Millbank, and I came out of law school. And um, I went to work for my firm in Washington, D.C. I wanted to be a litigator. Why? They, everyone on TV that was a lawyer was a litigator. It seemed interesting. Uh, I had the opportunity to be a bag carrier for a very senior partner in my firm. Most of you are too young to know who he was, but his name was Elliot Richardson, and he had been <laughs> attorney general under Richard Nixon and actually brought the Nixon administration down So, um, as part of Watergate. So it was a very interesting experience, and I got to do some Supreme Court-related litigation, some antitrust litigation, and slowly I discovered that I really didn't like litigation. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of research, a lot of formality, a lot of uh, adversarial stuff, um, and in my case, uh, a number of days being locked in a windowless room uh, going through uh, files. Uh, I ultimately got an opportunity to uh, work on a bankruptcy matter. It was actually the first time Continental Airlines went into bankruptcy in Houston while Gottschall was debtor's counsel. Uh, we represented the secured lenders, and I got um, I got a sense of what bankruptcy was like, and I really liked it because it really was a hybrid between litigation and a, and a transactional practice. And doing the bankruptcy work, I got to learn what lenders do, what collateral security is, um, and what the airline business is about. So I'm a fourth-year associate. Uh, my firm had been hired to represent the creditors on a large workout in Asia, and I was asked, would you move to Hong Kong? Well, I like Chinese food. Uh, I figured, what, what the hell? And I picked up and I moved to Hong Kong. I'd never been um, to Asia before. And I worked for about a year on a very large workout. The workout wound down. And I started to do what anyone does in a five-person office in a foreign country, which is try to keep busy. So I got involved with, um, with our aircraft finance practice, started representing a bunch of Asian airlines, 
um, on a very interesting um, cross-border tax product that was available at the time. Uh, spent my time in Hong Kong. I was up for partner, came back to the States, went to New York. I was recruited by our transportation finance head um, because I had done some aircraft work uh, to work in that area, and I spent the next three years working on lots of aircraft financings. Um, at the end of that time, they were looking at my firm for someone to go run our Tokyo office. And one of the airlines I'd been representing was Japan Airlines. So, okay, I thought that was fun. I, I like sushi. Off to Japan. Uh, went to Japan at a time when two-thirds of all aircraft in the world were financed by Japanese banks and Japanese equity investors. There were very favorable uh, tax regimes for cross-border leasing of aircraft. Two months after I got to Japan, the, uh, the Japanese government repealed the regulations that made it attractive for Japanese equity investors, so the bottom fell out of the market. Uh, there was no aircraft finance work in Japan. I had to reinvent myself. My firm had a strong project finance practice. I have a strong survival uh, instinct. <laughs> so I decided to take strength of my firm. I had a background in finance, put it together. Uh, project finance was just taking off in Asia. I read about it, I learned about it, I marketed with my uh, partners and other colleagues. Um, and, and lo and behold, I got hired by uh, the Export-Import Bank of Japan on what was the one of the first and largest uh, project financings in Asian history. I spent a lot of the next four years working on project financings in Manila, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Indonesia. Uh, five years in Japan, long time. I was starting to talk to myself back to New York. So I come back to New York, I sit down with my executive committee, and I go, what should I do? I'm approaching 40. Should I go back into bankruptcy? Should I do aircraft finance? Should I do project finance? And they said, no, we've got this new exciting area we'd like you to go into, and with your skill set, you can do it. I went into structured finance. Okay, what was structured finance? Well, I started off doing you know, securitizing mutual fund fees and airline ticket receivables from Latin America and all sorts of weird assets. And then there was a new product that came around called the CLO collateralized loan obligation, which is a kind of a subset of the CDO, which many of you may have heard of, you know, backed by subprime mortgages, um, which uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So I spent um, a good part of the next five years becoming an expert in CLOs, um, representing investment banks, structuring these. And I'm on a very nice vacation in Italy in 2008, spending a fortune, and I turn on CNN, and boom, Lehman, Lehman's bankrupt. People are talking about <coughs> major money center banks failing in New York, and I said, whoa. And uh, needless to say, the CLO market closed down. Anything with initials, anything that had securitization or structured associated with it shut down. My survival instinct took over again. Um, okay, what am I gonna do? Well, you know, the, a bunch of these structured products were going bad, and there was a structured product I didn't know about, but it was called the SIV, the Structured Investment Vehicle. And there were about 20 of these, and they ranged anywhere from $2 billion to $20 billion of liabilities. And I had my bankruptcy colleagues who were very busy, but they were, there's one thing that bankruptcy people are very good about. They know how to herd cats. They're experts on creating committees out of thin air. So, you know, this wouldn't be, you know, in a bankruptcy proceeding because it was nothing, you know, it wouldn't go into a Chapter 11 or Chapter 7. But with my bankruptcy colleagues, we made calls, we organized, we created ad hoc committees of senior creditors. And I spent a lot of the, the credit crisis working out SIVs, um, which kept me very busy. Okay, where are we today? The CLO market came back. It was one of the few structured products that performed very well during the credit crisis. Um, starting about two years ago, it came back gangbusters, and I'm busier than I could hope to be right now with a product that I'd written off as, you know, for dead uh, three years ago. And um, where will it be in two years? Well, you've got Dodd-Frank. You have a lot of regulations coming out of Washington. Uh, these regulations don't like securitizations. They want sponsors of securitizations to have... Uh, so-called skin in the game, and they're working on the regulations right now to do that. So it's conceivable that in two years when the regs are supposed to come out and, and become effective that uh, my survival instinct will need to uh, come into play again. All right. And we have, of course, follow-up questions on your uh, hiring partner aspect of your job, but we'll get to that in a minute because now we're going to go to Rory and ask her how she got into her primary practice area. Well, 
uh, I'm going to say that we all have a survival instinct in common. And when I graduated from, I'm a first generation American. I, gra Oops. I graduated from law school approximately 12 years after I came to this country. And I didn't know squat. I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't, I didn't even know people, you know, we were first generation to actually graduate from college. So I'm in law school. I never interviewed for a summer position because I really was, didn't really know and didn't really care. I wanted to do public service work. So I clerked for a judge during the summer between my first and, between my second and third year. Got out of law school, surprise, surprise, I couldn't find a job. So looking for a job it took me several months to land a clerkship at the appellate division in the second department. I stayed there for two years, really, really liked it, made some good friends, and made some good connections, which have stood me to good stead to this day. Um, when I started looking for a real job, again, just to make some money so I could go save the world, I ended up calling a friend who was doing litigation at a firm, about a 50-person firm at that time, called Parker Chapin Flatow and Klimple. Parker Chapin was in the, midst, in the midst of some huge antitrust work, and they were just sort of devouring bodies. I ended up doing antitrust work for about a year or two. Um, we lost to the Second Circuit and spent one summer doing a petition for certiorari to the Supreme Court. At the same time, I was getting married. I ultimately had three kids during the ensuing few years. And um, when anti Reagan sort of came into power, and that was it for antitrust work. It dried up. So I started doing financial services litigation and real estate litigation. And after that, it was some modicum of employment litigation. Um, and people kept me busy. I was easy to work with. I, I enjoyed the work. I started developing my own business because I looked around and people said, hey, you know, if you're going to be a partner in this firm, you'd better be responsible for feeding people rather than being fed. Um, I also built up a resume, which is something that I highly recommend to everybody. I love litigation, but I stumbled into it. Once I stumbled into litigation, it, it became obvious to me that my value lay in finding out what the trends were, what was hot, servicing the client's businesses. And I joined the ABA at a time, and I think that's still the case, frankly, where if you volunteered to do something, you could get ahead really quickly. It was a meritocracy. And I met people across the country, which helped me get business. And I built up my resume, because pretty soon I started to be a chair of this, a chair of that, and co-chair of the other thing. And it looked good for existing clients. So I, I, I was in demand. Um, then I realized that I really liked the business of law. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, and this. You know, I got to tell you, being a woman helped because there weren't too many women who were doing it. So I got myself on the administrative committee, the financial committee, finance committee. Pretty soon I was elected to the executive committee. Um, and then I kind of, you know, that all that experience helped in the next stage of my life, which I would say was bankruptcy. It's funny how all roads lead to bankruptcy of some kind. But... <laughs> Um, I was, there was a huge Ponzi scheme that came down in the late 90s. And where I knew it was a real estate Ponzi scheme done by a lawyer who fleeced a bunch of clients. I happened to know some of those clients, the potential creditors. And someone in my firm knew, knew the US trustee. And my experience, both in litigation and professional liability, and the general business experience, helped me land that trustee job. So I litigated that trustee job for, in that position while doing the rest of my litigation practice for the next six, seven years. Uh, recently, the same experience um, helped me get a position as a receiver in an SEC matter. And that went on for a couple of years. And if any of you watch American Greed, I'm on it periodically when, you know, it's not the competition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
I, I think that what we all have in common is really looking for opportunities and taking advantage of them when they appear. You can't shrug your shoulder and say, say no, something else will come along. I mean, walk through that door as we all did, and it's fun. I mean, it's fun, and it's a challenge, and it makes life interesting. Yeah. Now, um, litigation is still, by the way, a great place to right. be. Yeah. Now, I, I think as an outsider, that might be because America is a very litigious place. Do you see it remaining that way in the future? Oh, yes. I, I actually, look, litigation's changed. I mean, you don't have, you have garden variety litigation, but much of the litigation now, for example, is in the government area. So it would be Dodd-Frank. What's, where there's a lot of litigation is uh, the consumer area, the, the consumer debt area, the deceptive, deceptive advertising acts, the telephone, whatever it's called. It's all initials. The CFPB is going, you know, t bringing on a lot of litigation. So I see that going on for the next two, three years. I see intellectual property litigation going gangbusters for a long time. And I'm not talking about the soft IP. I'm talking about the hard IP. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, th I, you know, I don't know what else will happen in the next few years, but there will be litigation. Well, that's good. A little bit of balance to Bill's uh, doom and gloom. Peter, how about you? Where did you uh, start your practice? I started um, at the uh, Department of Justice in the uh, Attorney General's Honors Program. And um, what I was going to point I, I want to make before I forget to make it is uh, I think Bill made an interesting point he said you know get out of law and do something you love uh, what he's really talking about is passion so I start by saying if you're not passionate about being a lawyer for a particular area of the law then don't do it because you're never going to be good at it um, and uh, so I came with a fair amount of passion about being a trial lawyer that's all I wanted to do was try cases and so I interviewed uh, at a law school at the uh, Manhattan DA's office, couple of, I, I just wanted to get into court. And I was fortunate enough to get into the Department of Justice. <clears throat> and so another thing I will tell you is attitude. Uh, I manage 1,100 lawyers now in 19 offices across three continents. Attitude is a very important thing. Um, there's nothing I wouldn't have done. And uh, I think uh, you've heard stories about, I'll go to Asia, right? That's, that's a really positive attitude. Uh, and you see the, the career path that that leads to. So I went to the Department of Justice, and they were just forming uh, this little group called the Environmental Crime Strike Force. And it was during the Reagan administration. And uh, uh, William French Smith, who was the Attorney General at the time, wanted to put some teeth into the environmental laws. Um, and so they formed this little group. It was some very experienced prosecutors that got together. I was uh, supposed to be slotted to go to uh, something called environmental enforcement uh, at the Department of Justice, but another honors grad made a stink, uh, and she had to have this position, and she wasn't going to come unless they took this position. And they said to me, would you mind going in general litigation for a period of time? And I said, I'm here to serve. I'll go wherever you put me. And I wound up doing... Uh, Indian Affairs, uh, Native American Affairs, uh, National Historic Preservation Act things, things that a kid from New York City, and I grew up in the Bronx here in New York, knew nothing about. <laughs> but I would do it. I said yes. So I only did it for six months. And as a reward, they put me in this brand new strike force. So I was the official bag carrier, if you will, to some very experienced uh, environmental or prosecutors that became environmental prosecutors. And as a result of that, I started to get some very good experience prosecuting the first knowing endangerment account under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, cases like that. I started to get a reputation, and basically I was drafting behind some very talented people who taught me. When I left the Department of Justice, because luck is another thing that comes into life, and you can't control that, but I always found the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, so uh, I left the Department of Justice, and then this accident happened called the Exxon Valdez. And no one knew about environmental laws. Uh, so I, I happened to be extremely knowledgeable out of the area uh, in which would have prosecuted this. So I was put on that, uh, I was put on that particular project. Uh, and to this day, 
I, I serve as one of the lead trial lawyers for Exxon, so I'll show you how long that relationship uh, has lasted. Uh, now, it was no great thing to be put on this because Exxon had hired every firm in the United States, I think, to defend itself at the time, but I was fortunate enough to be the person they put on. Um, as I started to go in private practice, uh, as Aurora said, you know, the golden rule is he who can make some gold actually can make some rules. So I knew it was important to try to build a client base. Uh, and I did that by going out and lecturing and talking about different areas. But I looked ahead at the time, because this is, ties into your other question. Lee. I looked ahead and I thought, this area is getting commoditized. Um, because lots of companies are going out, they're hiring environmental lawyers, they're bringing them in-house because of the expense. Uh, and so what, the area I was in, as a relatively young lawyer, six, seven years out of school, just, just made partner, was going to get commoditized. So I sort of morphed my business into uh, mass tort businesses, essentially using my skill and my knowledge of the environmental laws, but combining that uh, when there are some very significant releases or accidents and you have mass torts. Um, as a result of that, uh, to this day now, that practice is uh, a very successful practice. I manage about 50,000 cases in the asbestos area. I employ about 12 law firms outside of my own law firm, and I serve as national counsel to Exxon in an area of litigation called MTBE, which stands for methyl tertiary butyl ether, which is a, a component to gasoline. Um, I've tried a bunch of cases. My last trial was uh, in the Southern District of New York for 12 weeks. Uh, being sued by uh, the state of New York, um, or the city of New York, I should say. So, you know, that's how my career sort of wound up. As, as that started to climb, uh, the firm uh, asked me if I would want to get into management, and uh, I thought that would be interesting. And I took over as the managing partner of the New York office uh, of McDermott, Will & Emery uh, in uh, August of uh, 2001. Uh, and we can all know what happened in, in 2000, in September of 2001. So it was a very uh, interesting time to uh, be managing a law firm. Uh, the economy was a disaster. It was a very tough time to be in the city uh, at that point in time. And uh, as as you know, as your career develops, uh, in 2009, I was asked by my I was became a member of my executive committee. I was asked in 2009. Uh, if I'd be interested in becoming uh, the co-chairman or the chairman of the firm, in which I said no, uh, I would, uh, but I'd split the duties with someone who I was pretty close with. Uh, it's, a, it's almost a billion dollar enterprise, uh, again, on three continents, and I wanted to continue to practice law, and I didn't see uh, my ability to practice law if I became solely the chairman. So we split the duties between two of us, and that's exactly what we do today, and I try to keep my hand about 50% in the practice of law because I remain passionate about the practice of law. And while I enjoy some of the things I do as chairman of the law firm, uh, I really enjoy still going back and being with clients and working on problems and being creative and having a good attitude uh, even at uh, you know 30 some odd years into the practice mm -hmm. of law. Peter, you talked about the commodification of certain types of legal work. Do you see that process as something that necessarily expands to other practice areas, or is it contained? Can you talk a little bit about yeah. how that works and, and how one recognizes that yeah, there, taking there's place? There's a constant, uh, lawyers are expensive. Uh, I mean, that comes as no shock to anyone. So you have this sort of economic force that, that sort of propels clients to try to minimize the cost of, of, of legal services. There are certain transactions, there are certain cases I have, for example, where the liability is so high that that's not, that's not the primary concern. But in certain areas, clients try to minimize the cost, and if they can bring the cost in-house, even if they pay a very good salary to an in-house lawyer with benefits and stock options, it's still less than $500,000, $600,000, $800,000 an hour, or whatever they're paying for a piece of litigation or, or a particular area. So there's this constant pressure for commoditization. There are certain areas that, will, that it will never happen in. It will never happen in bankruptcy to come back to bankruptcy. Uh, I don't think it will ever happen in the highly complex structured finance area, which has you know, there's a lot of tax issues that are involved in that. 
that's never going to happen. Litigation, you have to be careful, uh, and and because people will want to try to lessen those costs and therefore have that uh, potential for commoditization of a practice. One of the areas where it can happen, just to point out, might be IP prosecution. Even uh, well, probably IP prosecution. Yeah. They bring in that expertise. It's, happened, yeah. it, it's happening now. Mm -hmm. So I see that. <laughs> because um, I have maybe 120 IP prosecutors and we see the pressure on them so we're constantly looking to innovate to make sure those, prof uh, those practices remain profitable. Mm. I think we have time for a couple follow-ups. Uh, Bill, I'm going to come to you uh, for a uh, psychology question of sorts. Um, when you were in the process of getting into the bankruptcy space, uh, as it were, years ago, um, in your experience, your colleagues that were also jumping into the practice area, um, were they doing so consciously in anticipation of getting in early on something that was going to grow, or were they all like you and just kind of looking for a port in a storm? I believe everybody at the time, looking back, you know, 30 years, was surprised, shocked, how bankruptcy grew. And I think most of the people, frankly, in the uh, mid-1970s who went into bankruptcy did it simply because it was a job they got, not because they thought it was a great growth area, because uh, it didn't appear to be at the time. Hmm. You have to be sometimes more lucky than smart. Sure. I think it's, you know, I have to tell you, I, I did one major bankruptcy uh, and just ended after 10 years to show you the tail on it. But I think it's the most interesting area of law you could be in because it involves deal making, it involves finance, it involves corporate issues, and it involves litigation because you get to go to court and you get to argue. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I. Well, I absolutely agree with right, you about uh, that. I mean, I. Fascinating area. I, I enjoyed uh, every minute of it because it, it makes you be a generalist. Oh, yeah. It's a great, uh, great area. And that's why I enjoy that writing about it to today. Other practice groups. Yeah. Uh, Jay, uh, on the hiring side of your job, um, life has gotten a lot more complicated since the 2008 recession. Can you talk to us a little bit about how your life has changed uh, sure. when looking for uh, staffing your firm going forward? Sure. Um, yeah, the, the credit crisis really changed uh, law firm recruiting, and not in a positive way. Um, what I found is that as the, the big law firms started to retrench in terms of their hiring, uh, the law schools started to get more and more aggressive to make sure that their people got jobs. So what used to be a process that started after Labor Day and went through, you know, through mid-November um, in terms of going to school, so we would go to one or two schools a week, um, and the process would really run about three months had got compressed when the law schools found out, and um, it's very interesting, Harvard discovered uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the credit crisis because they were the, uh, no, it's gone. They were the last school always um, uh, to have, uh, to have uh, interviews on campus and then to uh, uh, do the callbacks. Um, they got caught in a situation because they were doing that in November the market crashed in October, and they were kind of left out there, and the law firms um, you know, were halfway through recruiting, and suddenly, boom, everything froze. Um, so then all of the law firms started moving up to the point that today, uh, you know, OCI basically takes place you know, over a two-week period. Um, and that's it's really, really less than that. When everyone is on vacation, you know, this is during August, and it happens so quickly, um, and it's, it's uh, I call it organized chaos that I don't know that it has done, um, done any favors for law schools or law students. In fact, um, I think it probably has hurt legal recruiting because it happens so quickly. These law firms have to throw out a lot of offers in a very short period of time. You know, you can do your statistical analyses, you know, to figure out what your yield is, but historically, you know, that doesn't always work, certainly doesn't work in times of economic stress. And what happens is I think the law firms have become a little bit more conservative and cautious, and they'd rather come in under their targets than over their targets. So um, I, I encourage any of you that speak to NALP to uh, try to get some, uh, some reasoning into the process, because I think it's, it's hurt the business. There is a movement underway uh, to try to push the schools to do the interviewing in the spring semester of the second year. 
the reason for that is you get another six month look or another semester look as a candidate and you avoid everything that Jay's just uh, addressed. Mm. What do you think the likelihood of? Uh, I think it's pretty good. Is, yeah. Is, yeah, because what's going to happen is uh, you have a number of firms. If you look at the top 30 firms, excellent. Uh, my guess is you'd have 90% of them uh, who are going to push for this. What, what happens if they decide there's also a movement to make law school in this Well, you know, listen, uh, in my other life, I'm a trustee of the university. I'm an adjunct professor at another law school. Um, and I'll tell you, I think it should be two years. I think it should be two years with a year of training that comes afterwards. It would be cheaper. Uh, people would have an opportunity to get jobs because it's more like the system that we use in Europe, uh, you know, in England and in Italy and France and what have you, where we have trainees. Uh, we don't have to pay them as much money. Uh, but they get lots of experience. We get an opportunity to see how people work in the real world, and they get real world experience. Right. I, so. I actually think you make an excellent point because I think there's, from what I understand, that this may depress everyone, but it's reality. I think law school, I mean, hiring right out of law school, you know, is going to stay class for the next couple of years, from what I understand, and talking to people. But, and that's partly because clients don't want to take the first year associate. But uh, I understand that lateral hiring is going to be, is projected to be up in the next couple of years. In particular, on litigation and IP litigation, um, some corporate, some private liability. But people, clients are willing to pay for someone with additional practical experience more than for someone who's right out of high school. Mm. Rory, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about geography. Um, you spent a lot of time working in the New York, New Jersey area, but you know an awful lot about the business of law all over the world. Um, how much weight should law students and recent grads put on geographic location when going through the analysis of uh, starting a career? And uh, if that is something that should be put into that analysis, which areas of the world, which, which regions, which countries are demonstrating uh, in your view, sustainable growth? Well, um, that's a difficult question. I, I mean, I think the New York training is prized everywhere in the world and everywhere in this country. So you come from a New York firm where you've been trained, you're valuable almost everywhere. Uh, right now, Houston is a very hot area, in particular in the energy area. And I think that's, the, when, when you say sustainable, I don't know how far out you I'll say two years. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we won't hold anyone on to a 20-year yeah, exactly. time frame here. Um, parts of Ohio, oh. believe it or not, really? are busy right now. And why you know, Why is Ohio busy? I really don't know. Huh. But there okay. are good firms there hiring. Um, I'm speaking to our China offices. Uh, Shanghai and Beijing are hiring. Is that sustainable for two years? Probably. I don't know what happens next. Right, that's really how I, I kind of got to crafting that question. I, I was sitting um, at, at my desk wondering uh, what it would be like to be a recent law school graduate today and I asked myself, should everyone just think about moving to places like China? Or I, I talked to a law firm consultant who tells me uh, very, very seriously that Africa is the place to be for growth in big law in the well, next five to ten years. I mean, should people be considering stuff like that if they can? Well, I certainly think that big law should open. A lot of, several large firms have opened offices in Africa, and I think it is the next frontier. I don't know that I want to be there right now, but it is. But I don't think that anyone can kind of graduate from law school and move to China or Africa or even Houston, frankly, unless you have a little experience and you know what you're doing or talking about. I mean, at a minimum, that's a business experience. You can't just go to a place where you don't know anyone. Or unless you have um, language skills. If I could go back to college where I was a sociology major, my, my ex-wife always asked me what I intended to do with that, open a sociology store. Um, but I would go back and, you know, I would study Portuguese or Japanese or Mandarin because with those skills, um, you know, it, it, you can't just be the ugly American traveling the globe anymore and, you know, professing to be an expert on everything. The language skills, the cultural awareness are of increasing importance, particularly in China. I mean, we won't put anyone in China that is not really fluent in, in Mandarin at this point. Follow up on that. 
let's think in the same terms, albeit <coughs> domestically. Mm -hmm. Even if you go to law school here, if you originally came from somewhere else or went to college in, you know, in Ohio, Mississippi, eh, I don't care where, think seriously a go about going back there. And mine just went off. It sounds like. We'll take that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there is advantage in the hometown atmosphere. I, I, you can make it in Houston or Dallas coming from Yankee land, but believe me, as somebody who grew up in Texas, you're a damn sight more likely to be uh, accomplished if you actually grew up there. Because when you travel around the country, somebody will say to, you'll hear somebody talk to another lawyer say, where did you go to school? They don't mean, where did you go to college? They mean, where did you go to elementary school? So think about, uh, about that. Something else to think about these days is being entrepreneurial. And here's what I mean by that. There are some areas of practice that can be very successful and even lucrative, either by yourself or with a very small firm. Take, for example, two areas, I think, that most uh, you know, significant law firms turn their noses up at. And I'm talking about personal injury, plaintiff's work, and uh, debt collection. I know in both of those areas uh, a couple of people who are fabulously wealthy, and I mean fabulously, far more so than had they worked for the biggest law firms in the United States. Now, you don't have to intend to be fabulously wealthy to be a PI lawyer or a debt collector, but you can make a very damn good living in those areas. The rest of the legal profession is going to think you're scum, but you know, that's too bad. You're actually helping real live Americans out. So think if there is some place, some niche, where you can use your personal drive to be able to help out real honest-to-God Americans who have uh, legal problems. One other point that I would make is to be careful, not careful, but uh, clearly evaluate your personal skills and preferences. If you can't stand writing, do not be a litigator. On the other hand, if you love to write, if you're good with the English language, if you can write persuasive paragraphs, think about it. If you're good at crossword puzzles, think about being a tax lawyer because that's about solving problems with no obvious answers. Um, uh, I could go on the list, but it's not necessary. But think about non-legal things that you like to do because I guarantee you there's going to be some area of the law where those skills can be best utilized. Mm -hmm. Peter, um, you're running a, a very large law firm, and I, I wanted to ask you um, where you see big law heading in the next five to ten years. What are, what, what's your firm going to look like? What are your contemporary firms going to look like? Do you see the model changing? Well, I see certain aspects of the model that's changing because uh, there's lots of margin compression that's going on. Uh, there's lots of margin compression that's going on in our business. So I think, um, I think you're going to have a bunch of specialty firms uh, that will be, you know, a certain size. You know, maybe they're a litigation firm or something like that. Um, and then there will be very, very large law firms like mine. Uh, and mine's among the smallest of the very large because, you know, there are those with 4,000 or 3,000 lawyers. Uh, what we're going to do is continue to globalize. Uh, you know, in the last two and a half, three years, I've opened in Paris, I've opened in Frankfurt. Um, I've been in Shanghai for about six years. Uh, I will open in Beijing. I've opened in Korea uh, last year. So we're going to continue to push out uh, an international model uh, because we think that's, you know, that's for us where our clients want us to be, where, where I think we can work cross-border, uh, cross-disciplines, cross-geographies. Um, and as the market continues to shrink, and as you know, we use the term convergence counsel, 
as lots of corporations, you know, want to s shorten the list of firms that, uh, that they go to, they're going to go to firms that have, I think, an international footprint. So that's, that's where we're going. That's our bet. That's our investment. Um, it doesn't mean that if a, uh, if a firm is, you know, uh, a litigation firm in the U.S., it's going to fail. There's always going to be room for that. But that's, that's the path that we're going to take. Mm. Do you think it's going to be a smaller um, segment of the industry in five to ten years' time? Are fewer lawyers going to be practicing on a percentage basis in big law than are today? Yeah, because we're seeing that. I mean, uh, my summer program went from 90 lawyers to 30-some-odd lawyers, 92 to 30. That's a dramatic change. It's a dramatic change. Uh, and there is discussions whether summer programs are valuable now. Uh, you know, uh, we're evaluating that. I, I we'll continue to do it. Think about it. We're making a decision. We made a decision in September about someone that will come join us uh, two years hence. And that's a problem. And we got stuck when in 2008, 2009, when the market collapsed. We had 90 people come in. We didn't have work for 90 people. We wound up to preserve those jobs, we wound up secunding those lawyers to clients free of charge so they had things to do. Uh, and it was a real lesson for us. And mm -hmm. I don't think we're going back to, certainly not in my tenure in the next four or five years, will we go back to really loading up you know, 90, 100 lawyers. It's, in some it's an extremely difficult environment to run a business in. Yeah, having said that, I, I, I do want to say this. I think it's the greatest liberal arts degree you could have. You have been taught to think, to digest, to argue, uh, and y you know if you're passionate about being a lawyer, be a lawyer. But if you're, it doesn't hurt you to walk into business, to be go into HR, to go into um, other aspects, and say I have a law degree. You know I passed the bar, but I, I want to work here instead. Companies I think will find you very attractive uh, because they know that you have a certain level of dedication, a certain level of academic discipline and rigor that you've brought to your life. Um, and, you know, there was a time where most of the CEOs of the Fortune, you know, 100 were lawyers. That's, That's changed now, but it's still a very valuable degree to have. Uh, most of the bankers that I deal with are, have law degrees. Uh, they're, they're bankers. They're investment bankers. And they're in, you know, fixed income or whatever they do, but they have law degrees, a lot of them. So it's a very, still a very powerful degree to have. Mm -hmm. So we've run about an hour, so I think that's a good place to uh, leave it and open it up for questions uh, from the audience, if we have any. I know we got a couple over Twitter, but I wanted to let the living and present go first, please. Yeah, well, I would, I would pick three areas. I would pick antitrust or competition. MOFCOM in China is, uh, is a very powerful uh, uh, agency, and, is, and it's showing its power now on these deals that are cross-border. So for me, um, MOFCOM is the Ministry of Commerce, by the way. Uh, for me, antitrust, and that's what we're doing. We're building our antitrust capability. We actually are taking lawyers from our Brussels office, which is the sort of competition head uh, uh, for Europe and shipping them to work with our uh, Chinese partners in, in Shanghai. So that's one area. Intellectual property is a very, very uh, hot area, uh, especially in China, because there are lots of issues in China as China continues to struggle with their intellectual property laws and the application of those laws. It helps, and I think it's almost mandatory, frankly, to have a, a technical degree because you're evaluating, uh, you're evaluating um, uh, patents, and you know you need a certain expertise either on the electrical or life science side in order to do that. And the final area is, I would say, the finance and cross-border M&A activity. Uh, uh, people are going to do deals. Those deals are are going to be cross-border. China, as you know, is uh, is very interested in in uh, minerals. It's, it's going to Africa, it's going to the Occident, it's going to South America. Um, so when it does that, it has to, you know, it has to do deals. Either it's uh, you know, government-owned entities or these hybrids. 
and you're going to need corporate lawyers and M&A lawyers to do that. So I think if you're, especially if you have a skill set in the language uh, that was said earlier, I, that, that's a great advantage. You're welcome. I, I actually think I just spoke to someone recently about this. A lot of the banks and financial institutions in Asia are looking for compliance people, which is also a way to enter um, into yeah, I think compliance is something that crosses borders and uh, is attractive here as well as in Asia and every other country which does business. Sure, I think I saw somewhere that J.P. Morgan was looking to hire over the next two years um, some ungodly sum of, of money on new employees coming in to do compliance work for them. It's yeah. just I, I know that they've sort of lawyered up in compliance. It's become a lawyer's job. Morgan Stanley has tons of those jobs. Um, AIG, Goldman Sachs, all of them need compliance people. Mm. Other questions? Yeah, everybody always asks, um, you know, what, what what are we looking for, and uh, in terms of entry level associates, and I see the associates are getting prepped by their career offices to try to say that they want to dedicate their lives to what the latest hot area in the law is, and the reality is that um, I think it's probably true for all of our firms that we don't. You know, we don't do recruiting based upon what a, a second-year law student says they want to do, particularly when they have no idea what it is. Um, and I still think, you know, that we look for bright, personable people. And the personable is really, it has become more and more important because, you know, in the olden days, you could hire, you know, a genius from a top law school who couldn't uh, communicate with clients and lock them in the library and I guess they could do research for a few years. I think now, you know, you, you really want to get all of your associates in front of clients at the earliest opportunity. It's important to the associates because they want to feel connected and, um, you know, it, it's important um, certainly in my shop to train up young lawyers really fast because the clients don't want to pay for the training. Um, I mean, you know, my firm has gone as far as we've set up a relationship with Harvard Law School where we are sending every associate in my firm from third to seventh year one week a year um, to go. It's basically, you know, like in a little mini executive MBA uh, program where they're taught by Harvard uh, business and, and law faculty to, you know, try to get them to understand the business, not only the business of law, but the business of our clients. Because if you want to be a really successful finance lawyer, you better understand finance. With that said, you don't need an MBA, okay? I came, you know, with my sociology degree. It might have been easier with an MBA, um, but, you know, you, you learn. You know, you'll learn through CLE. You'll learn through, um, you know, watching podcasts, through reading. And, um, you know, there's no magic. Um, and I don't want to discourage people, you know, that, that you know, it, first of all, big law is not the only law, okay? It's, it happens to be, you know, kind of what I recruit for, but, you know, I see, I know a lot of very happy people that are not in big law, and I know a lot of very unhappy people that are in big law. Um, but with that said, I am an optimist. I, you know, I've been through a lot of economic cycles. Yeah, this is a, this is a bad one, um, but it's not the Great Depression. And you know, if you're if you're smart, you, you know, figure out what you're really good at, what you stand out at, um, and if you exploit that, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, whether it's in big law, whether it's in a DA's office, um, whatever. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know, laws around you know is is here to stay. And I think um, you may see some some contraction, but um, you know, for the biggest cases. The biggest deals, you know, I still think, uh, you know, New York City is, uh, is where it's at, although 50% of my firm's business has for the past decade been cross-border. 
and you know we talk about China and what you should be boning up on. Uh, I came into the office this week to discover that a Chinese investment firm had purchased my office building from J.P. Morgan Chase. So um, you know, and they uh, they hired a lot of big guns to do that, um, and a lot of opportunities out there. Anything else? You're young. Thank you. Already had a career. I've worked for the New York City Housing Authority for the last 17 years. Also hold a master's in public administration. And since I was 21, so 30 years ago, I've always wanted to be an attorney. I've sort of gone through the application process. was not successful. I'm going to do it again. Um, and I guess I sort of want to know how to, to package correctly the experience that I have to get into law school and then sort of looking into the future, how to package that to get into a big firm. Well, I don't know if I feel capable to tell you how to get into law school and package because I that's that's not an area of, Yeah, that's not an area where I have expertise okay. to you know, I I I I think all you guys are talented and I don't know how they make decisions out of say yay or nay, you know, uh, uh, to allow you other than on the scores that you have. Uh, I don't know if your background uh, naturally leads to big law, right? Because you, you were in public administration. Um, what you might want to consider is a firm that has a strong legislative um, program. Because my guess is, given your background, that you spent a few years dealing with Albany or dealing with yeah, the I'm city council. You were a lobbyist. There you go. So uh, that's your strength. That's your hook. So. Uh, you know, I think you would be attractive to a firm that has that capability uh, because of your background, because of your experience already as you walked in. So that would be my, you know, if you were looking for a hook once you have got out of law school, that's, that's the hook I would use and focus on those firms. Okay. Got a question on Twitter here, and it, it dovetails with a lot of comments I've received in the past couple of days about um, how firms consider work experience acquired recently after law school, uh, namely going and doing document review uh, for something other than a law firm. Um, is that something that would necessarily disqualify them from employment in big law? Is that something that helps? How is that viewed these days? Uh, uh, you want to answer that? Oh, okay, thank you for that. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. she, I just she's not I wanted to see who would jump at that, that first. I went to Harvard. <laughs> um, it is a very tough question. You, you know, it's funny because I, I, I think we're in a very um, snobby uh, profession. Uh, and I can say that because I went to a school that is not very regional, if you look at my background. So I say that having made it despite the fact that I went to a, a very, very regional law school. Um, you know, I, I don't think it would disqualify. Uh, we, we hire lawyers that have done lots of document reviews. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to think that they have a lot of experience in the discovery area. Can they morph into being an associate? It depends on their academic record. I mean, where we get pretty rigorous as a firm is on academic record. We want to see people who perform well. You know, I think our cutoffs at 3.5. Don't hold me to that because I'm not the, I'm the chairman, not the managing partner uh, or the hiring partner, I should say. So we look at academic rigor, and we understand that in today's environment, it may take a while for even the most qualified to get a job because there's, you know, there's not a lot of jobs out. Now, you know, we should be honest, there, there are a few select schools where I think it's pretty, not, not easy, but I think the jobs are there. Uh, but in more regional schools, it's more difficult, it takes a little time. And there are tons of diamonds in the rough. Uh, and, you know, uh, someone may call me that. So I, I have a particular fondness for people who have picked themselves up by their bootstraps and have, uh, you know, fought the elements and have made it despite the odds that are against them, that tells me a lot of, uh, they have a lot of stick to uh, they have a lot of drive, and a lot of passion about what they want. And, you know, that's, that's pretty good to have someone on your team that has that sort of commitment. Mm 
All right, I saw you shaking. Yeah, I, 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 it's all right. I think I've got this one. Yeah, um, <laughs> doesn't stay hooked onto my jacket, but it works. I, I think that the best bet for anyone in a position where they do something that's not particularly what they want to do or or not really up to their uh, skill set is to do the best they can at, at what they're doing. So for example, the person who's doing document review on a major litigation or on a due diligence, set out to impress the people you're working for and working with, because that's the way you land the job. I mean, we've had situations where we brought people in. I remember one of my partners, he started out as a part-timer, not out of the summer program. He was working part-time because we needed some help and he impressed people. We hired him into the litigation group. He's now a partner. So impress the people you work, in, work with, do the best job you can at that document review, and see if you can get a job at that place where you're doing the document review, yeah. at least the first job. And um, I, do see, uh, I do see from time to time uh, lateral hiring, including at my firm, from smaller litigation firms. Um, because I mean, litigation there, you know, litigation in a small firm and a big firm, there are some common elements as opposed to you know, if you want to do CLOs, there aren't many you know very small firms that do them. But you know, litigation it can provide uh, an entree. And you know, I, I I have the same discussion with my 20-year-old son who's um, in college, and you know, every time you know he gets something less than like an A on the exam, he goes, oh, this is it. I'm not, you know, I, I won't get a job at Goldman or Bain. I know those two firms always come out, and I go, not law firms. <laughs> and I go, you know, yeah, you're right. You're probably not going to get a job at Goldman or Bain, and you probably wouldn't want one. But um, you know, there are you know other ways to find your way to Goldman or Bain, or to find your way to uh, to happiness. And uh, it, it isn't always the most direct route. Yeah. Any other questions before we tie up here? Oh, we got one more. That's a that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I think it. Uh, in my case, it it uh, it's a combination. Um, it uh, some of it, you know, is your is your uh, your gene pool, and some of it is just is, is circumstances. And I think you know today, it is. Um, you really have to have a strong survival instinct. I mean, I even I'll go back to my son. You know, well, I'm worried I'm not going to get a job, and I, you know, I sometimes I tell him, you know what, you probably you probably won't, and you're going to wind up, you know, living with me, or I'm going to have to find an apartment for you. But that's the that's the the new world we're in, and um, you'll make it. it. Might take a little bit longer, but the survival instinct. Um, and Peter was saying this before. Uh, you know, at law firms, uh, I think is you know is is a very valuable instinct because everyone always talks about you know the law firm. You know, the the firm won't let me do this, or th and as though it's there's like a body there that is you know thinking about you. You know, the, the, they're not thinking that much. Um, and I always tell people, you got to look out for yourself. That doesn't mean you step on your colleagues, but you know you have to make your own path and um, you know make a future for yourself. And um, you know that uh, surviving is is very important, and you know, and I've been through you know a number of phases in my, in my career where you know practices just dry up, and being nimble is 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 critical. Yeah. All right. Right answer. That uh, I would like to thank New York Law School for uh, hosting this panel today, and I'd like to thank this uh, spectacular panel for their their thoughts and insights and experience. Uh, it's really a uh, stuff you can't find anywhere else. And I'd like to thank the audience for uh, being so attentive and thoughtful in their questions. So with that, I bid you all a good evening.